Now at 11, a canine cop goes rogue in Vancouver. How he got loose, bit a bystander, and indecent exposure at a local Walmart. I told him I said, get away from me, you're sick. While the courts are having a difficult time keeping an alleged repeat flasher behind bars. And workers call for a boycott of Fred Meyer, why the union says the store isn't paying men and women the same way. We are going to begin tonight with a plane crash in Gresham. You can see the plane went down into some brush. These are new images coming into us tonight. And while it is dented up and banged up, the people inside were taken to the hospital. Firefighters tonight telling us probably what you're thinking yourself, looking at these images, that the people on board are very fortunate. It wasn't a lot worse, especially when you take a look at where it went down. This is Ritchie Road in Southeast 182nd Avenue. And in this area, we have buildings, we have homes, and we have a lot of places that it could have landed and been a whole lot worse. Let's go to KGW's Catherine Cook. She is live right now at OHSU where these victims were taken tonight. Catherine. Dan, first responders tell us it appears the two men on board sustained non life threatening injuries. Right now, it's unclear how the crash happened, but witnesses on the ground tell us it looks like the pilot did everything he could to find that open field. I think I've seen everything now. <laughs> Rafael Dronka knew something was wrong when he looked up and saw the small, low-flying plane teetering over his Gresham home Monday evening. I was in the front yard playing with the kids, and my wife's like, hey, is something wrong with that plane? And then I looked back, and I was like, yeah, that's not right. And then it just went down. The Beechcraft Bonanza landed in an abandoned nursery near 182nd and Ritchie Road. Its wings crumpled among shrubs and trees. Gresham Fire Engine 73 was the first on scene. A lot, lot of things going through our mind. Battalion Chief Jason McGowan says both men inside the plane were conscious and made it out on their own. Life Flight transported one to OHSU, the other went by ambulance. There are a lot of houses in the area and they found a field. So that to me tells me that, you know, there had to be some skill there to put it down where they did. Federal aviation records show the plane, built in 1951, is registered out of Estacada to a Chris P. Broussard. It's unclear who was on the plane when it went down. It is incredible, uh, amazing, that uh, two folks could land this plane or crash this plane as safely as they could, not cause any injury to any others, and cause minimal injuries to themselves. Right in the bushes. Rafael Dronka couldn't agree more. He's thankful he and his family are safe and believes from the pilot's point of view that was no accident. It did get close to a few houses, probably I'd say about 200 yards, 300 yards, not too close. He did good. He sure did. Sheriff's officials tell us the NTSB and the FAA are investigating how the crash happened. Dan, back to you. Stories like these often end differently, Catherine. Thank you. Caught on camera, a police canine breaks away from its handler and attacks a bystander. Take a look. And as you can imagine, the Vancouver Police Department is now investigating this incident. Let's switch to KGW's Mike Benner. He's in the newsroom. Mike, you spoke to the man who shot that video. Yeah, I did, Dan, and he is baffled by the attack. He tells me he was filming an arrest outside his apartment just in case anything went sideways. Nothing did. In fact, he thought it was all over. And that's when the canine went after somebody who had nothing to do with the original police operation. Take a look. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Some tense moments on a downtown Vancouver street corner. Cell phone video shows a police canine attacking a person walking down the street. Downtown gets a little wild, but nothing like this. No, nothing like this at all. Nathan Lux is the one who shot the video from his second floor apartment at 13th and Columbia. He says it all started when he noticed some police activity around 5 o'clock Sunday evening. It just seemed like a little stakeout thing and uh, one of the residents here was uh, taken into custody. According to Lux, as officers put that person in the back of a police cruiser, a police canine bolted across the street and attacked somebody walking on the sidewalk. As I was recording, all I was like hearing was just heel, heel, heel. And so the dog was not listening to any of the commands whatsoever. Um, and then just the follow up, there was even like restraining the dog or pulling the dog off of the guy. Uh, it took a lot of effort, it looked like. It happened so quickly. It just happened quickly. Joe Gold witnessed the whole thing, and he's relieved to know the person attacked suffered only minor injuries. I felt bad for the guy that got bitten, but I also felt bad for the officer that lost control of the dog. But then I thought to myself, well, they're going to probably have a lawsuit over this or something. That's unclear. What is clear is that this attack will stick with witnesses for some time. Oh for some guy to kind of walk up behind and then just get attacked was 
pretty, pretty appalling. All right, the Vancouver Police Department did release a statement in part. It says the department will be conducting an internal investigation related to the incident and the canine will be removed from deployment until the investigation is complete. We'll, of course, stay on top of the story and pass along any new updates on air and online. For now, Dan, back to you. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Now we want to get you caught up in some of other uh, headlines from tonight. Deputies say a truck involved in a chase on I-205 today was filled with stolen items. Police started chasing this in Canby on Highway 99, and that chase ended on I-205 just north of Johnson Creek Boulevard. You see it, it's a budget truck. Deputies used a pit maneuver to stop that thing. Both the driver and the passenger are suspected in multiple car prowl thefts that happened in Canby over the last couple of months. We're trying to figure out exactly what was in the back of that thing. Police say a woman shot and killed her husband during an argument at their home in northwest Portland. It happened this afternoon on Germantown Road. The Washington County Sheriff's Office says the woman called 911 and she told dispatch that her husband pulled a gun on her and she used her gun to kill him. The couple was going through a divorce. We don't know yet what charges she might face. A man is in jail tonight accused of holding up a Portland cell phone store at Knife Point. The AT&T store on Northeast Broadway was hit last night. Investigators say 55 year old Lance Fluker, who you saw a moment ago, took items from that store, threatened an employee with a knife, knocked another one to the ground. Police caught up with him a few blocks away. In our big story breakdown for you tonight, we're taking a look at that call for a boycott at Fred Meyer stores. The grocery workers union is as the one asking shoppers to avoid the stores and they are now negotiating for higher pay and to close what they say is a gender pay gap with regional supermarkets. KGW's Morgan Romero gives us a look at the pay structure that's at issue. An outside agency dug into the data and found men are making more than women at Fred Meyer stores in our area. But it's not that women are making less than men doing the same job for the same amount of time. In the grocery contract at Fred Meyer, there are Schedule A and Schedule B jobs with different wage scales. A makes more than B. There are mostly men in Schedule A, while women are more likely to work in lower paying Schedule B jobs. That is driving a gender pay gap. Historically, women have worked in Schedule B departments and those jobs have always been paid less. Schedule A departments include grocery, produce, cold wall, wall deli, and beer, wine, and liquor departments. They make $17.20 an hour. Schedule B jobs include bakery, deli, cheese, coffee shop, and e-commerce. They make $13.50 an hour. This study found workers in both schedules stock shelves, prepare food, and give customer service. So the union argues they all have their own unique challenges and should be paid about the same. I think it's a legacy problem. So Schedule A and Schedule B, the, the concept of having these two schedules that different departments fell into uh, started when women went to the went to work in like the 30s mm -hmm. and all of a sudden women were put in the delicatessen and they were called delicatessen girls. Oh, we knew that Schedule A and Schedule B were making different amounts, yes, but we did not know that that was causing a gender disparity. More research needs to be done on the why. Is it that women are more drawn to jobs in the deli or bakery versus men? Does management funnel them into those paths? See, overall, the biggest factor in the gap is the disproportionate number of women in lower paying departments. Fred Meyer Communications Director Jeffrey Temple still says there's no pay gap based on gender and they don't funnel people into certain jobs. That was our Morgan Romero reporting. Fred Meyer says boycotting their stores will hurt employees and their families, impacting customers, and it helps non-union competitors. The union has voted to authorize a strike if they have to, but negotiations continue later this week. Now we want to give you an update on a story that we've been following for you for months. It surrounds a 13-year-old cancer patient. And this girl was caught in the middle of a medical custody battle. She testified today saying again that she does not want surgery. But despite her opposition, the state is moving forward with it. Kylie Dixon's surgery is scheduled for Friday, in fact, but she and her mother are still fighting to stop it. Kylie told a judge that she doesn't want this surgery, that the only reason she agreed to it in the first place was to try and stay with her mom. Kylie has been in state foster care since June, when her mother failed to follow a court order to bring Kylie in for a prescribed medical treatment. Her mom, Christina Dixon, has told KGW that she believes alternative treatments, things like CBD oil, should be used instead to treat her daughter's cancer. 
The state claims various medical experts agree that without surgery, Kylie will get sick, will get sicker, and will die. The judge is expected to make a ruling later this week, literally just hours before Kylie's scheduled surgery on Friday. When we come back, we're going to hear from two women who say that they were flashed at a local Walmart. And here's where it gets even weirder. The police say that this suspect has done this several times before. Plus, you ever see scooters like this parked all over the sidewalk? I'm, I'm betting you probably have. A KGW viewer sent us this picture. We're going to show you the best way to report this to get some action if you don't like it in front of your house or in your neighborhood. And later, hey, that's Nicolas Cage. What brought him to the Rose City? Raising Portlandia? Hmm, that'll be fun to find out. All right, check it out on Sky Show. We've got ourselves a really dramatic scene over Mount Hood like this with the clouds moving on in. And there is a weather system moving into the northwest. The rain threat is pretty small, but it is going to get colder as we go to the weekend.